Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I'm Joe. I'm an alcoholic. It's good to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Had a nice drive up here from Santa Monica. Um, my sobriety date is August 17th, 1982, and I'm very grateful for that date. Um, for a long time, I was told and I had an, an idea that gratitude was just an emotion and that I could go home and make the right list or think about it long enough, and I would go home and I would just get angrier and angrier. And then I would try to love somebody. And I loved them. And I would think about it. And some people would tell me I could go home and make the right list. I'd be able to love them. I would just get angrier. I found out gratitude's an action, not an emotion. And I express my gratitude for Alcoholics Anonymous by responding to what I'm asked to do. I'm not a circuit speaker anymore. I was. <clears throat> and like everything else I've ever used in my life, it almost killed me. Um, <laughs> I've never enjoyed anything in my life that I didn't take to the gates of insanity and death. Um, and it's a horrible thing to become somebody in an, in an anonymous program. Um, <laughs> And I did, in my own mind, at least. And um, I remember at my home group once in Santa Monica, a guy came all the way from the valley or something like two hours, and he asked a couple people, where's Joe Hawk? And they pointed me out, and he came over, and he said, I came all the way from the valley just to meet you. I said, why? He said, well, I heard you're a multimillionaire recluse who stays in his apartment and only comes down to his home group once in a while to impair direct revelations from Bill and Bob. (laughs) I said, you're not far off, but it's a little bit of a stretch. Um, Since then, I found you have to take the criticism as well as the praise. And um, um, even the stuff I've been criticized for are gifts. I look for teachers in a lot of different ways nowadays, like resentment. Fear is a great teacher. Um, People you don't like are great teachers. Because they're not going to change. But I can change my mind. Um, Geographically, in these 22 years, I uh, I got sober in Denver, Colorado. And I was there for five years. And then I was moved. I didn't choose to, but I was moved through this process outlined in this big book to even kind of against my will. I was pretty comfortable in Denver. My sponsor was down the street. Some of you know him, Don, Don P. And uh, some of you know Bob Olson. And um, I didn't want to leave Denver. And at uh, five years of sobriety, I came out to to, to L.A. to make some amends. And one of those amends was um, uh, an ex-fiancé, um, or what I like to call uh, God's will, number one. And um, and you're absolutely convinced, aren't you, that it's God's will? And um, I still think it was, but not what I thought it was for. Uh, and um, part of my amends was she. I asked her. I made the mistake of following directions, which is a horrible thing to do in AA, unless you want to get free. Um, and I asked her what I could do to make it right. And she said, be in L.A. twice a month and we'll go to therapy. Not only did I not want to be in L.A. twice a month, I didn't really want to go to therapy either. And I said, okay. (laughs) And uh, uh, the next day, an apartment on the beach in Santa Monica was put right in my lap. 
by someone that didn't even know why I was there. She just thought I was visiting. And she said, check out this apartment. I said, why do you think I'd want an apartment in Santa Monica? She said, I don't know. I always listen to people who say, I don't know why I'm telling you this, but... And uh, I ended up staying 10 years. I'm alcoholic. Uh, and then I was pretty comfortable once again. And at uh, 15 years of sobriety, um, I was moved once again, not by choice, and it was not what I would have picked, but it was a lot more, it was a lot more amazing than anything I could have come up with. You know, I think if you're trying to live a spiritual way of life, whether it's, you know, in a marriage or in a job, but if you can look back at the last several years and say to yourself, I never would have dreamed. You know, if you would have told me five years ago, if you would have told me at 14 years that in about a year I was going to go to India for five years and stay sober, and start a drug and alcohol treatment program for the Tibetan government for the first time in their history. They, they have access to Alcoholics Anonymous. I would have said, you're crazy. Nobody would want somebody like me to do. I always sell myself short. And I always sell this program short. And I'm sure maybe as Bob Olson talked about and maybe Don, I'm a recovered alcoholic. I don't suffer from the false modesty that some people do after a long period of time. And I don't, I suffer from what the founders of our program suffered from. And if you know, if you know that, um, the first 164 pages have never been changed, and those people in those 164 pages claimed that you could recover. Not that I'm cured. I have a daily reprieve, not contingent on what I do. But I used to think it was. And uh, it's contingent on the grace of God continuing to be in my life and a conscious contact. Mm, you know, no one, no one that wrote in that book had more than five years. Bill got sober, what, 34, 35? The book came out in 39. And uh, on the first page of the first forward to the first edition, they said that they were over 100 men and women who had recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. And that to show other alcoholics precisely how we have recovered is the main purpose of this book. I doubted that. I take it for granted. But how long does it take till you can begin to claim some spiritual progress that, you're, that you can't take the credit for? That's another realization of grace. I mean, if you had cancer 22 years ago and it's been in remission for the last 22 years and you don't suffer from the effects of that cancer anymore, you might not be cured because you could go into remission, but you could sure claim to be recovered. I don't take the credit for that state of being, but i got to tell you, I haven't had the obsession to drink or a physical craving for a long time. I have a much deeper thing, though. It's a spiritual malady. Some people I've met in AA have a one-part disease. They have a physical craving, but they just don't drink no matter what, and they never get that physical craving ever again. That's one of the... I'm not going to comment on the message in Fresno because I don't know the message in Fresno, but in Los Angeles, one of the main messages is we just don't drink or use no matter what. Now, if I could just not drink no matter what, I wouldn't be here tonight. But I have a twofold disease because I have the mind of an alcoholic that continues to take me back to a drink. I have a lot of experience to prove that. And that's been treated through the 12 steps. But then I started to find out I have a much deeper disease. I have a threefold disease. You see, the people with twofold disease, they just don't drink no matter what, and they work on themselves because they can. And they can surrender. They can bring about their own surrender. My God, if I could have surrendered, I think you'll be able to tell from my story, I would have surrendered a lot sooner than I did. I didn't surrender August 17th, 1982. I was surrendered by something much more powerful than myself. And I think it was a magical combination, not just booze. A lot of people surrender to booze and we never get to see them. Sometimes in AA, where I live, I'm, we're shielded from alcoholism. 
And we don't get to see the deaths that some of you old timers used to get to see. They're kept from us. And I forget sometimes most people die from alcoholism. There's a myth that AA, you, that people get sober in Alcoholics Anonymous and stay sober. You can, but it's a small minority nowadays. Most alcoholics die from alcoholism. Now, we're all going to die, but I believe somewhere along the line you're given a choice. You can either die from alcoholism or you can die with alcoholism, free. Uh, I think a lot of you know you don't have to drink again to die from alcoholism. And that's not because of a physical craving or a mental obsession necessarily. That's because of a part of my disease that was there before I ever took a drink. My big book says that I'm not only bodily and mentally ill, that I'm spiritually sick, and that when the spiritual malady is treated, I'll begin to, over, I'll begin to straighten out mentally and physically, and that that's what I needed to treat. I needed to treat that stuff that was there before I ever took a drink. Um, uh, so I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, Tomorrow I get to talk about the steps, and hopefully there will be a lot of participation. We can have more of an interactive. Maybe some folks will even have an experience, and maybe even I can, because that's what I'll pray for tomorrow morning, for an open mind and a new experience with the 12 steps. Um, you see, there's a big difference for me between exposure to spiritual principles and experiencing pr spiritual principles. Exposure to it is not necessarily experience. A lot of us know that from our own lives. Sat in churches, went to seminars, heard great lectures, great speakers. And you walk out of a wonderful sermon with a friend who's not an alcoholic. And he says, I never knew that before, that when I do this, this, and this, this is what happens. I'm going to go home and I'm going to try that. And he goes home and he does it. And you go home and you try it for about a week and it's just horrible. You just can't keep it going. Because we suffer from a disease that's rooted in lack of power. Whether you're talking about once I take a drink or now that I've stopped, I don't have any power in that situation. Once I start, I, I get this craving for more that I can't control. And once I stop, I get this mind that I can't stop. And it has to have more. It has to have more of what treats something much deeper than just my own mind. I, uh, I grew up in uh, Battle Creek, Michigan, which is halfway between Detroit and Chicago. And that's about what I was like. <laughs> halfway between Detroit and Chicago. <laughs> there was a band that... that um, was from Battle Creek, Junior Walker and the All-Stars, and um, I took drum I wanted to learn how to play drums, and Junior Walker's drummer was my teacher, and, uh, and I saw these people, and I looked at them, and I looked at my life and my family, and they had something that I wasn't experiencing in my family, and I wanted that. I wanted to be black, and it uh, didn't work. And, <laughs> And I had a dream. I had a dream one day that I would, I would play drums for Junior Walker and the All-Stars in the El Grotto Lounge in Battle Creek, Michigan. And I would be high on heroin. And that dream came true. And I was still empty. Every dream I ever got before I connected to my own spirit fell through. Because the dream comes and your spirit's still empty. No dream can fill that place. And... I didn't have some of the excuses that I heard when I came to AA for why I was alcoholic. You know, you hear a lot about the yets. You know, I haven't done that yet. I didn't have a lot of yets, but how come we, and I can't be the only one that had this story. How come we never hear about the if-onlys? And I had my little if-only story when I got to you. If only Daddy hadn't been 60 years old when I was born. If only I hadn't grown up in Battle Creek, Michigan. And then I would hear people say they were alcoholic because they were abused, and I wasn't. So I thought, well, maybe if I had been abused, I wouldn't have turned out the way I did. 
And I heard people say they were alcoholic because mommy and daddy were. My mom and dad weren't. So I thought maybe if they would have been, I would have learned my lesson and I wouldn't have done that stuff. And I had my little if-only story. And I got here when I was 30 years old. And one day somebody told my little if-only story and he turned out just as sick as I did. You know, a lot of people think the search in AA is to find truth. I think I've found more lies than I have truth, and it's just through a process of elimination <laughs> that you get to something that closely resembles the truth. A lot of people think AA is a program that you can learn. Thank God you can't learn AA because I would have graduated a long time ago, gotten a diploma, and I would have had an ashram in India where you'd be coming to visit me rather than me coming to visit you. Uh, and I didn't know this for a long time until someone asked the right question. I also thought looking in the big book or talking to a sponsor is about finding the right answer. And I found out it's not. It's about finding the right question and not answering it right away. You pose me a question. Why do I think I'm alcoholic? If I tell you what I know right away that makes me alcoholic, I've stopped any experience I can possibly have with that question. But we're so programmed from when we were since we were young that Whoever raises their hand the quickest is the best to answer the question right away. But the questions that were posed to me, they said, weren't even meant to be answered. They were meant to be considered and experienced at a gut level. So now, you know, I'm certainly glad that I'm not a member of the part of AA that says you do one through nine once. I'm very glad not to be, not to have settled for that. Because i got to tell you, if I was still operating in the world at 22 years of sobriety based on an inventory that I wrote 21 and a half years ago, I'd be one of the most wonderful people you ever met. <laughs> because I would use the rationalization that my mind has tried many, many times in AA. Well, I'm not sticking guns in people's faces anymore. I'm not going to jail. Haven't been to jail since I got here. You know, I'm not like that anymore. But what am I up to now that's going to kill me? What about this stuff now? See, I think because it feels more subtle, that, that subtle means less dangerous. But see, whatever's blocking me from God now is just as dangerous as the stuff that was blocking me from God then, because I know better. <laughs> and that's my problem. This thing. I think I know now. And it's a lot harder to work one through nine at 21 years than it was at 21 months. You know, the stakes are a little higher. I've got some stuff now in my life that I really love. I know people that have been doing the work in this book for 30, 40 years, and some of them say that doing the work in the big book on a regular basis is like taking your life and throwing it up in the air and seeing where it lands. One of my heroes was the manager of the Denver Central Office. She managed that office for 30 years. She's now 45 years sober, and she used to say that to me. And then I watched her one time at about 20, 25 years sober lose a husband of 13 years who left in the middle of the night, just like that, and left her a note that her power and clarity intimidated him. And there she was. And I watched how she went through it. She didn't go through it without pain. You know, you can do that. There's medication for that if you don't want to feel. But she was feeling the pain, but she did it with dignity and grace and recovering. We went to the state convention together that weekend, and I watched how she went through it. And I asked her to tell me about 10 and 11. And she asked me some really interesting questions, but I'm jumping ahead of myself. Um, I don't know. In the middle of a family where I really couldn't put my finger on why I felt, you know, because... I'm the guy that thinks how it works says that I'm supposed to talk about what it was like <laughs> and what happened and what it's like now. It's not what the book says. I'm supposed to tell you what I was like and what happened and what I'm like now. I used to be a speaker that would tell you what I was like, what I was like, what I was like, what I was like, because nothing had happened. <laughs> Something's got to happen for what it was like to change. There will be no what it's like now. What it's like now is like what it was like then. I'm just not drinking, right? <laughs> right? 
What it was like was I didn't have some of the excuses that other people had when I looked around. There was a family with wealth, opportunity. I was spoiled. I had a strong father and a loving mother, no alcoholism. But I started to, you know, that's around the time they keep saying to you, you have so much potential. <laughs> God, I would hate when they would say that. Right? And, then, and then at age 12, I found a solution to this problem I was having. And the problem I was having was I didn't feel like I fit. You ever met a real alcoholic that didn't feel that way when, before they ever took a drink? I mean, why did Dr. Silkworth say that a part of my disease separates me and differentiates me like a distinct entity? And the first time I read that, I thought about daydreams I had in my parents' backyard before I ever took a drink, like 9, 10, 11 years old. And I would have these daydreams that I still remember. And the daydream was a little spaceship was going to land in the backyard and a little green man was going to get out and he was going to say, Son, you weren't born here on this planet. <laughs> We brought you here as a teeny baby, as a test to see if you could fit, and you failed, and we're taking you home. But that spaceship never landed, and a question started to develop in my mind as everybody else, my older brothers, everybody else was saying, you have so much potential, and you're laying there in bed at night, and you're thinking, where is it? Where is this potential? And then you take a drink at age 12. I started with Chevis Regal from my dad's liquor cabinet because it was there. <laughs> like, why did you climb Mount Everest? Because it was there, right? <laughs> why did I drink Chevis Regal? That's what was there, right? And then I, I like to say I slowly worked my way down, you know. <laughs> After you puke on Chevis Regal, where else is there to go? I mean, you, got, you know. You change the stuff that's not brown. That's all I knew. I didn't like the brown stuff. I liked the clear stuff. Right? But something happened. And you listen to a real alky. And they may not describe this the first time they drank. But if you can get them to when alcohol started working, when alcohol starts to do for you what you can't do for yourself, that's not an esoteric statement. That you can find a power greater than yourself that can do for you what you can't do for yourself. I'll tell you how practical it was. Two weeks before my first drink, I go to the, the junior, the junior high school dance, whatever grade I was in. And there's a little girl across the room I wanted to dance with. I couldn't do it. I could not do it. But I couldn't stop thinking about it. That's the difference between a resolution and a decision. Because <laughs> two weeks later, I went outside and slammed down some Boone's Farm Apple Wine. Remember Boone's Farm Apple Wine? <laughs> With some guys. And went back in that gym, and I asked that girl to dance, and I danced. Because i got to tell you, when you live halfway between Detroit and Chicago, you got to dance, because if you don't dance, you ain't doing nothing else. <laughs> and I walked back in that gym, and it was, it was real. And it was practical. It wasn't no esoteric. Esoteric stuff doesn't work for alcoholics. Same as this program. Some of it, if you're new, some of it sounds like out there. You know, you hear the ninth step and you're in step one. And you think it's still going to be the same you. They might be talking about this spiritual stuff and you're going to be transformed, but isn't it really going to be me at my best trying to make those amends? You know. Thank God it's not. Right. Mm. So I, I described when alcohol started working for me to my sponsor, and he says, it sounds like you're describing a spiritual awakening. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you hear her real alky talk about when booze started to do it. might not have been right away, but at some point it starts to do something. And i got to tell you, I am not one of these alcoholics that my worst day sober is better than my best day drunk or whatever that is. I don't even know how to say it right. <laughs> I had some great times drinking. <laughs> and I've had some dark times sober. <laughs> I had a ball. I had a ball. People that say that whatever that slogan is, however it goes, I wonder how they drank. It's like the guy that told me getting off cigarettes was going to be getting lot like getting off heroin. I said, what kind of heroin were you doing? <laughs> <laughs> 
It's not even the same universe. <laughs> or the guy that said alcoholism and drug addiction are the same. <clears throat> that kills a lot of people in this program because you never get to a truthful first step. And we used to go through all these debates, and I used to have this nauseating story about put a hundred people in a cabin and have them drink every... It's as simple as this. Anybody in this room with time that's alcoholic knows people that could take or leave drugs that are alkies. And everyone in this room knows addicts that could take or leave alcohol. They're not the same. They are not the same. They're rooted in the same disease. But i got to tell you, I had to find my truth because I did a lot of drugs. So I found booze at age 12. By age 14, 15, they didn't know what to do with me. Battle Creek was too small. And they sent me away to, to Boston. And that was heaven. First time I saw a street in Boston that was like a mile long, just lined with drug dealers, I, th I said to my friend, is this heaven? <laughs> right? And bars that I could go into and fake ID, and go into New York, and then Woodstock. And then because I'm a chameleon, I become a hippie. I was a hippie with a bad attitude. I was like, <laughs> and within one year, I was a criminal. The summer of love didn't last that long. Because <laughs> after six years of a lot of fun, by age 19, they put me in the Michigan State Penitentiary. Uh, my third felony... Daddy bought me out of the first two. And the first two were serious. The first one was sales of marijuana when sales of marijuana was the same as heroin, 20 to life. And Daddy bought me out of it. And I thought I was cool because I got a deferrent from the draft and didn't have to go to Vietnam. And by the time I was convicted, I got convicted of a misdemeanor and kept the 4F from the draft. <clears throat> that mistake was made because they sent me to a military school in seventh grade for the summer, and I saw these military guys when I was in seventh grade, and I said, no, nah, mm, mm, mm. I don't have anything against the military. If it wasn't for military, pacifists wouldn't be doing very well. <laughs> my troubles are of my own making. That's just the way I turned out. I don't know. <laughs> Thank God AA doesn't make any sense. Everything that ever made sense to me failed. And isn't it interesting? The only thing in my life that doesn't make sense to this day has worked. Everything that made sense failed. Why? Because it makes sense <laughs> to this. And this is what got me here. And I remember saying to my sponsor, I'm terribly afraid of my own mind. And he would say, you have good reason to be. Right? <laughs> So I look back now, and I don't see it the way I did 21 years ago after my first inventory. Because if I would have told you my story 21 years ago based on my first inventory, my problems would have been of a lot of other people's making. My big one, and we all got our big one that we hold on to to keep, to keep from being responsible for what's going on in here. You've got to keep the problem out here. You know, I believe recovery begins when the problem's no longer outside of you and when there's nobody left to blame. And as long as there's somebody to blame and the problem's outside of you, recovery will not begin. And that's how it was for me. But my big one was my father was 60 when I was born, and by the time I was 10, he was 70. And he didn't teach me how to play baseball, and he didn't teach me how to fish. And, uh, you know, in therapy, all those years after, it used to cause me a great deal of pain. Now, here's how recovery is different. In recovery... Since I've woken up a little bit, my father's age when I was born gives me a tremendous amount of hope for the next nine years of my life. <laughs> for you new people, that's because I would like to be doing when I'm 60 years old what he was doing when he's 60 years old. You have to explain that in different parts of the country. <clears throat> that was my big thing. I didn't have a lot to put my finger on for why I turned out the way I did. And then I had six years of trouble from 19 to about 24. After my third, my second felony was an armed robbery. It was just kid stuff when I was 18. And the guy that was going to testify against me was persuaded in a loving, kind way not to do that. And he decided not to do that. And I walked out of the courtroom. <laughs> Imagine having to go back to that guy and make amends. I did. I did. 
I don't have a sponsor that edits my amends list. <clears throat> I was at a place in New York a couple weeks ago, and they, this one guy said that his sponsor took off every relationship he was ever in with a female off his amends list. Told him he couldn't do that. My sponsor told me those relationships were some of the biggest things in my life and that I could get free, but I better let her know why I was there when I called. Don't let anybody amend, re, um, uh, edit your amends list. Each one is a piece of freedom they're taking away from you. In Denver, even, they told me I couldn't make amends to someone who was dead. Not my sponsor, but some of these other people. My two most powerful amends had been at graves <clears throat> to the two closest people in my life. So I had six years of fun, six years of trouble, and then I got out of the penitentiary, and I barely made it through parole. Parole is harder than time because you have all the rope in the world to hang yourself, and I don't need a lot of rope to hang myself. It was a short noose in Battle Creek, Michigan, let me tell you. <clears throat> and I made it through parole, and I got my dream that I came out of the penitentiary with. My dream when I came out of the penitentiary, I went to the penitentiary for, uh, it sounds better if I say what I was convicted. I was convicted of attempted uttering and publishing. If I say it that way, you might think I was a famous author who wrote something that wasn't quite right, but no, I wasn't. The original charge was forgery, uh, <laughs> but they lowered it to attempted uttering and publishing, and I would tell guys that I was an author, and uh, they'd say, what do you write? And I'd say, checks, because right? I wrote uh, $55,000 worth of $136 payroll checks in five days for a guy who wanted to help me out. I'm still leery of that phrase nowadays, even when I hear it in AA, because this was a brother that wanted to help me out. And he didn't help me out. He helped me in <laughs> to the penitentiary. <laughs> and uh, I told that to Scary Frank once in Denver that that uh, guys that scare us, they scare Bob Olson and Don Pritz, this guy. And um, I said to him that uh, alcohol took me to the Michigan State Penitentiary. And he looked at me like I was an idiot, which I was. And he said, what did they convict you of? I said, forgery. He said, then forgery took you to the penitentiary. Alcohol got you out. And they, they, um, I, I was lucky. I got sent to a camp. It was like summer camp with black guys. It was cool. Nobody wanted to get in any trouble because they'd send you back behind the walls. And I drank every day in the penitentiary. I never understand people who say they go to jail, they can't drink. Mm. Where there's a will, there's a way. Or where there's no will, there's a way, depending on how you look at it. It's like that commercial with the grape juice and the little kid says, when you got to have a drink, you just got to have a drink. We made, we, I, was, <laughs> I was the guy they all thought was crazy because they'd make spud juice in the penitentiary and it's supposed to blow up once and then go back down and then blow up again and you're not supposed to drink it when it blows up the first time because it'll make you blind and I would drink it and they'd all look at me like I was crazy and they'd say, you'll go blind. I'd say, that's why I'm drinking. It doesn't scare me, right? Got to have a drink. And they let me out when I was 21. So I spent my formative years in the Michigan State Penitentiary from that kind of a family. My grandfather was vice president of Post Serial. It had absolutely no effect on my life. <laughs> Alcoholism is a little stronger than what class you come from, what color you are. I heard a guy once, he did a retreat for our group, and on, after the whole weekend on Sunday morning, 30 of us sitting in a circle, and he looks around the circle and he goes, AA is not for women. And the whole room was like, and he said, AA is not for black people. Everybody was like, he said, AA is not for gay people. Everybody was like, he said, AA is for alcoholics. I was like, mm. <laughs> <laughs> and you remember, alcoholism doesn't care. But now I say thank God for alcoholism, and I say thank God for every drop I ever drank. Number one, if the kid that didn't find something at age 12 hadn't found something at age 12, I probably would have blown my head off if left untreated. That condition, feeling that way, and making those kind of decisions. I made a decision the first time I went into that place. You know that place. And it was the night when my dad had his first heart attack. And I could hear the commotion, and I could hear the pain, I could hear the ambulance, I could, and I couldn't move. And you go into that place, and then you come out of that place, and you say, I'm not going to ever go in there again. 
And once in a while with alcohol and the right combination of drugs, you could go into that place, but it wasn't real. And then I had six years of trouble, like from 24 to 30. My dream when I got out of the penitentiary was to deal blackjack in Las Vegas, Nevada, and have it going on. And it was a little unrealistic since you can't deal blackjack in Las Vegas with a felony, but where there's a will, there's a way. <laughs> and um, in a pretty crazy, I won't bore you with the whole story, but I had one more report to go on paroles, which means I had 30 more days I'd just squeak through. I had to transfer back to my mother's home. She lied for me. It's a cunning disease, al -Anonism. <laughs> They do everything alcoholics do without alcohol. Lie, cheat, steal, right? blame it on you, just like we do. <clears throat> I almost married one once. She came to our group in, a in Santa Monica with seven years of sobriety and thought she was alcoholic and that she was feeling a little off. Picked this, unfortunately, picked the strongest woman in the group to go through the steps with and found out she was an alcoholic and finished amends and became somebody I didn't really want to be with. <laughs> As I'm going around the country talking about the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, I lost somebody to the 12 steps that I wanted to spend the rest of my life with. We're good friends today, and she came back to the center a little bit, but her getting well was about getting strong. I fell in love with a pa peaceful um, woman. Uh, I'll also say to you, I made it through the penitentiary, celibate. <clears throat> I don't need to explain that to those I don't need to explain that to. But um, she uh, was peaceful and loved alcoholics and loved Alcoholics Anonymous. I didn't know she loved alcoholics just a little too much. But... Uh, <laughs> She finished amends and got free and found out from daddy to every boyfriend she ever had she was a full-blown Al-Anon and became strong and assertive and wasn't really crazy about her dependence anymore, which is AA, and got free. And at the end of it, I didn't really want to be with her. <laughs> That's funny. That was God's will number three. And um, uh, so through a series of... Uh, Intuitive experiences, I got out of the penitentiary and ended up in Las Vegas, Nevada, into the arms of a man who was like my, I was, I loved more than my father. I had known him since I was 17. He had four of us put one of these stars on our hands when we were 17, and they're all dead. That's another reason I'm here today. That's a more personal reason. They died and I didn't. Why is that? Well, I think God loved them a little more than he loves me. I'm still paying my ticket and they got to get free. <laughs> I'm not one of these that believes that those in this room are the chosen ones. <clears throat> chosen by God to be his messengers on earth. No, I think more like Chuck did, and that we're, we have, we're the ones that haven't quite paid our ticket yet. We're still paying our ticket. Yeah. So, there I was in Las Vegas, Nevada, dealing blackjack at the Dunes Hotel after working downtown and after dealer school and had the penthouse and the cars and the clothes and the women. And then this man that was like my father that got me all those things, got me into that industry, he uh, died in my arms of a drug overdose of drugs that I paid for with my money. And I lived with that from the time I was 24 until the time I was 33, three years in this program. And you have to think back to how would you feel if you felt you killed the closest, the, the person in your life you loved more than anybody. And you can't live with that. And he died, and a part of me died, and within six months I'd lost everything, and I got on a plane in kind of a chase scene thing to the airport, and um, <laughs> I went to Key West because I heard it was the furthest southernmost place in the continental U.S., and it's a great place to go if you couldn't get a visa. I couldn't get a visa to leave the country. Went to Key West before it was really a, a tourist spot. This would have been 1974 or five, and uh, it was more like Colombians and Cubans and people on the run, and the police were more crooked than the drug dealers, and I was just in heaven. I never had any trouble. I did whatever I wanted. You couldn't get in trouble in Key West. <laughs> you could do everything you wanted to do and not get in trouble. For me, that's heaven. And um, 
It's in this last six years of drinking that I find my truth about why I'm not a real drug addict. Because I made up my mind one day that I didn't like the way cocaine made me feel and I never did it again. Walked away from it on my own power. And I share that with a real addict and their eyes glaze over because they tried that a million times. And given a sufficiently strong reason, I stopped. I had a couple bouts before that with heroin and I woke up one day and I said, not that I don't like the way it makes me feel with like cocaine. I said, I don't like where this stuff takes me. Gets me in trouble. Never did it again the rest of my life. So by the textbook, by our textbook, I'm a hard drug user who's a real alcoholic. Now, do I have the delusion that finding that out means I can use drugs and not go back to what I have no choice over? Now, that's a little confusing because most people in some places will tell you that the drug you have absolutely no choice over is your drug of choice. It's very deceiving. The only time I had a choice over drugs was when it was yours, right? <laughs> And I gotta tell you, a lot of people have come to our group in Santa Monica, because in LA you get people with a lot of different problems. Because it's a city filled with people with a lot of different problems. <laughs> and I was used to Denver, where the fellowships are pretty clear. And, uh, I'm not saying you can't be both. I'm saying find someone that'll give you the dignity to find out your own truth. And not push it on you. There's groups in LA where the whole thing is, is to find a new person and bring them to your group. There was a time in this program when our success rate was a little better than it is now where you were taken to recovery before you were brought to the group because they cared more about the group than they did themselves looking good by bringing somebody. Our big book says that our success rate was 75% when, you, when, the, when people were taken to recovery before they were brought to the fellowship. You didn't come to a meeting until you were in the eighth step. That's not what we do now. We do it the other way around. We bring them to the fellowship and tell them things like, wait till you feel better to work the steps. I think it's the other way around. You should probably bring them to your meeting and say, you're probably not going to feel much better until you work the steps. All right? <laughs> New York, some places, they say we work a step a year. Cool. <laughs> Imagine Bill, Dr. Bob, if he had called Bill Wilson rather than the other way around and Dr. Bob called Bill Wilson in his first year of sobriety. He said, you'll have to wait 11 years, 11 years until I get to step 12. <laughs> step a year, I wouldn't have made it. I made it six months, I was ready to kill myself. After having a great time for six months, boom, there it is. You know what that is. <clears throat> and isn't it funny, when my parents used to tell me I had so much potential, I had a question in my mind that, a lot, that I, I lived with in this program from time to time and when I was new. And you all know what that question is. What's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? I love this person more than anybody I've ever loved in my life. I say I'm not going to break her heart and I end up over here and I've broken her heart. I didn't want to. You didn't choose to. Guilt and remorse aren't for alcoholics. How can you have guilt and remorse over something you had no choice about? Guilt and remorse are for people that could have done something better. My mom, I was six years sober before my mom said that she understood why I did the, what I did the day of my dad's funeral. The day of my dad's funeral, I was 21 years old. I was in the same hospital that he was in. He was in the intensive care unit. I was in the psych ward after those check things, after my writing career was over. And um, <laughs> he's in the intensive care unit, and I'm in the psych ward. And he doesn't know that. I was in a family where they kept stuff from each other. I'm sure at the country club I was the son that was usually at camp or away at school. <laughs> oh, he's at camp, right? I'm in the penitentiary. That's about whatever looks good in that, in that whole lifestyle. <clears throat> and, um, I'm in the psych ward. My dad's in the intensive care unit. They take me to see him two days before he passed away. We had a nice talk. Two days later, he passed away. They took me to his funeral. And I was taken to his funeral by a guard because I was still basically in jail. And uh, my mother said something to me she never said to me in the eight years I'd been drinking. She said, please don't show up at your, drunk at your dad's funeral. And with all the love and everything I had to muster, I said, I won't. And I meant it. And I didn't have that little plan in the back of my mind. And I asked him, could I go across the street to say hello to a friend? And they agreed. 
and I went across the street to say hello to a friend, and he asked me, did I want to have a beer just to calm down? And I said, I'll have two just to take the edge off. And somewhere between the second one and the 20th one, I lost the power of choice. I didn't have any control. And I showed up so drunk at my dad's funeral, they tied me to a tree by my ankle with a chain at my own father's funeral. And I didn't want to do that. And I didn't choose to do that. And that's why I say to you that I'm glad I, my drinking took me beyond choice. And I'm so glad I didn't come here with one. Because a lot of people come here and they still have one. But my sponsor pointed out to me that, that if, the day, if the day comes in sobriety that I think I have a choice whether I drink again or not, that's the insanity of alcoholism they describe in our book. Everybody in those chapters, there is a solution, more about alcoholism, whether things were sunny, not a cloud on the horizon, or the guy that was mad, or the guy that was working for a company he once owned, or the guy that was 35 years sober and out came the carpet slippers. Every one of them fell victim to the same belief that somehow they had a choice. The idea that I have a choice today is as insane as the idea I had a choice when I got here. Because I believe this. In a fit spiritual condition, there's about as much choice to drink as there was to not drink when I got here. And the reason I say I'm glad I, I drank past choice was I've watched people in this program who believe they have a choice suffer, suffer, suffer. Because then there's a choice about the steps. And then all of a sudden how it works says that the steps are suggested. How it works doesn't say the 12 steps are suggested. It says this is a suggested 12-step program. Some people make it sound like AA is over here and the steps are over here and never the twain shall meet and you'll just be fine hanging out in the fellowship and just not drinking. But i got to tell you, I'm a guy that just not drinking and going to meetings did not treat my alcoholism. It brought it to the surface because I was around these guys in Denver that helped bring it to the surface. They didn't just, Bob Olson ain't a hugger, right? <laughs> he ain't a warm and fuzzy kind of guy. And the guy that scares him, Frank McKibben, wasn't warm and fuzzy with me because they knew I was an alcoholic when I got here. And they didn't punch, they didn't hold their punches because they, here's what I found where I got sober. They loved me more. They cared more about whether I lived or died than how I might feel about what they had to say. Because I got to tell you, that's not easy. And that's not easy if you want to be popular. And that's not easy when you're trying to be a circuit speaker. <clears throat> I don't care about being popular anymore. I care about being effective. And effective isn't always popular. <laughs> Things are so... I heard this joke the other day, so I had to add my own little bit to it. And the joke is you really know when things are upside down in the world when the uh, most famous rapper is white, the most famous golfer is black, the French accuse us of being arrogant. <laughs> Germany doesn't want to go to war. The tallest basketball player is Chinese. And the message of Alcoholics Anonymous is no longer popular in Alcoholics Anonymous. That's when you know it's upside down. And I don't know about up here, but down where I live, except in a few groups, the message of Alcoholics Anonymous is not popular in Alcoholics Anonymous anymore. Then you have to ask the next logical question, what's the message? Well, i got to say this. <clears throat> My sponsor told me not to, but I'm going to. <laughs> he lives in Denver. I live in Los Angeles. I'm not going to say he won't hear this because I've gotten in trouble for that before, but it used to be very simple. A lot of people in this room got sober on the third edition of the big book. And the third edition of the big book, if some dummy asked you, where is the message? You could take them to the paper cover, if you still had a paper cover. If you were like me, you threw the paper cover away and covered your cover because you were more ashamed of being sober than you were of being drunk. <laughs> Everyone in town knows all this crazy stuff you do. You get sober and you don't want anyone to know. I don't want to break my anonymity, right? I think anonymity is at the level of press, radio, TV, and film to protect us from me, right? I always get it confused like personalities before principles certainly doesn't mean I should put principles before my own personality. Right? <laughs> I heard the traditions read one time and they got to, st to tradition 12 and the person said, animosity is the spiritual foundation of all our traditions. And I thought it really is kind of, isn't it? It's the only way AA grew or we'd all be in one group. Right? Imagine one group per town. 
Ooh. Ooh. You'd have to get free. <laughs> so I don't know. I had six years in, in Key West, and that was more like I was trying to die. And you know, it's really hard to wake up one day and realize, especially for those of us that tried suicide, and I always love to get a drug addict who says, I never tried to commit suicide. I'm not like those people, failing to realize every shot, every fix could have been death, and you knew that. I'm not going to talk about drugs, but in the dope world, it's really strange that somebody ODs, and that's where everybody goes to get the dope. <clears throat> but they're not suicidal. Uh, you know. And I had a head full of knowledge and no power to do anything with it. And that's a horrible place to be in an AA. To know more than you have the ability to follow through on. To have more affairs than you do principles. <clears throat> Which is the first thing my sponsor told me about step 12. You've got to have more principles than you do affairs to practice them, right? And I had all this knowledge about myself because I'd, I'd been in eight treatment centers. I had a master's degree in psychology. It took me seven colleges to get two degrees, but <laughs> I'm flexible. <laughs> I like to move around and see the country. Seven colleges later. Here I am in Key West and it doesn't go away. And I'm not doing drugs anymore. I walked away from drugs. It was me and booze. And um, tried to leave Key West five times. I'd get to Miami. I'd walk into a bar. I'd spend my money. I'd go back to Key West. And the game I was playing at the time was I would call home to Battle Creek, Michigan, and I'd say, I'm coming home. And they'd say, no, you're not. How much do you want? I thought for a long time I was paid to stay away, but that's when I wanted to be a victim. What I was was blackmailing my family. <laughs> it's a little different than being paid to stay away. <clears throat> And that wasn't in my first inventory. And I couldn't tell you that today. <laughs> Therein lies another reason I'm glad I write in, uh, business, which takes no regular inventory, usually goes broke. Right. Next time you're broke, take an inventory. <laughs> that could be physically, mentally, emotionally, or spiritually. Um, so after trying to leave Key West five times, I had to trick myself into leaving that's a strange thing when you're able to trick yourself. And I came up with a plan to make it so I'd have to leave Key West. And the plan was rip off the right person and you'll have to go and you'll have to go quickly. And I'm not stupid. I might be alcoholic, but I'm not stupid. I ripped off the right guy and I had to go <laughs> quickly. Now, if I would have known that I was going to go back to him many, many years later and make amends, I still would have done it because I didn't have any choice. And there's no guilt or remorse in that. I didn't have any choice. It's like, the, it's like the nine questions in the sex inventory. And the ninth question says, what should you have done instead? It doesn't say, what could you have done instead? What I could have done instead was nothing different than what I did. What I should have done instead was like somebody with some power would have done. But I suffer from a disease that's rooted in lack of power. Lack of power is my problem, not lack of self-esteem. If that's not evident by now, I'll just share a little longer and you'll know that low self-esteem is not my problem. But a lot of us know, a lot of us know what it's like to feel low self-esteem. But you know why you got low self-esteem? Because of some self-esteem that's so high, you could never live up to it and you gotta feel like a piece of you know what. Low self-esteem is a big con job sold to us by people in the field. They ought to be talking to you about having just a little too much self-esteem. And that's why you got low self-esteem, because you're the greatest boyfriend in the world. And when she leaves, the greatest boyfriend in the world can't be left. <clears throat> so I tricked myself into leaving, and I had to leave quickly, and I went and ran to the last friend I had left in the world, and he was in Denver, Colorado, and I'd known him since I was seven. And I got there and he said, there, um, you're welcome to stay with my fiance and I, but there's one thing. She doesn't like me to party and you can't drink. And I didn't want to drink. And I said, great. Two weeks later, she threw us both out. 
And my best friend since I was seven left me on a street corner, 30 years old in Denver, Colorado, more scared than when they put me in the Michigan State Penitentiary. Why was I scared? I have no idea. I wasn't doing anything illegal. See, I was really proud because I got out of the penitentiary made up my mind I'll never be arrested, I'll never go to jail, I'll never be in a cop car, and I'll never go to the penitentiary ever again, and I never have. <clears throat> Except in the effect that alcohol has on me. I can be able, friendly, intelligent. I can be a psychopath. I can be diagnosed bipolar. Give me the right day, I'll show you any symptoms. <laughs> The thing about bipolar and manic depression is it's so similar to untreated alcoholism, you don't know what you treat. And I'd say do the first nine steps and then see if you're still manic depressive. Or stay on medication the rest of your sobriety and you'll have a jolly time because you won't feel anything at all. <clears throat> or, <laughs> but my book says there's only two choices. Or they don't even call them choices. My book says there's two alternatives, die an alcoholic death or live on a spiritual basis. <clears throat> Don't be mad at me. I'm just trying to carry the message from the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> Don't be mad at me. <clears throat> so I had to leave. There I am in Denver. He drops me on this corner. I do what I know to do. I go to treatment. Because I still had a great Blue Cross Blue Shield card. It was good for 30 days every year, every 12 months. That's unheard of nowadays, but some of you used to go on summer vacation. I used to go to treatment once a year for 30 days. <laughs> but this time I was only able to stay two days because I had to have a drink and I still wasn't done. Nothing worse than trying to get done in AA. Ooh. I remember a guy at York Street in Denver. He was always new and everybody at the club knew him. And he was in the meeting one day and there was a lady from another club who came to chair the noon meeting. I got sober in meetings with like 20 people around a table with a topic. And this lady opens the meeting in the general way. You wouldn't have thought anything. Anybody here in their first 30 days, John raises his hand. Everybody claps. She says to him, keep coming back. Nothing abnormal there, you wouldn't think. Ten minutes later, John raises his hand. He said, I need to say something. She says, what? She says, uh, he says, uh, I'd like to ask you people not to clap and pay so much attention when I'm new because I get more attention when I'm new than when I stay around for a while and quit telling me to keep coming back. That's my problem. I think I can. Mm. And your mind goes, whoop. <laughs> that saying keep coming back to somebody could perpetuate a reservation in their own mind that will kill people. Keep coming back. You got another chance. Might as well just say that, huh? <clears throat> you don't ever have to drink again. Those of you in this room that are new, if you're done. See, we're not here to get people done. You got sponsors 20, 30, 40 years sober, they'll encourage you to drink. And then you got the ones that'll try to stop an alcoholic from drinking. Now you can ask any Al Anon in this room what it's like to try to get an alcoholic to stop drinking. You're either, I think Lois said it in our book. Either You're either in the grace of God or you're not. Don't worry about it. Right? I didn't read the chapter to the wives for a long time, and I was in Dallas a couple years ago working for a friend of mine. And this book study I was going to, they were reading the chapter to the wives. Now, why not read the chapter to the wives? Well, I've never had a wife. Why read the chapter to the wives? That's like thinking you're a big-time believer, so you shouldn't read We Agnostic. Nothing worse than working with a big time believer because they got to, they believe what they believe and they believe what they believe is true. And they gotta go back through all that to get to where an agnostic starts. <laughs> I'd much rather work with an atheist than a, than a big time believer in AA. Right. So, I had to leave treatment after that two days because I had to have a drink. They put the pajama law into effect in that treatment center because of me, and I was proud of that. And only in A would somebody be proud of something like that. Right? The doctor, I saw him not too long ago, Dr. Larry. He's 40 years sober now, and he said, I still hold the record of anybody he's ever seen how long in detox. I was 15 days in detox just from alcohol. And I'm, I was proud of that. <coughs> it's like I walked into a meeting in a foreign country one time, and there's nothing on the wall. People are not introducing themselves. The meeting had already started. I'm hardly ever late. And I was even sure if I was in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. 
But somebody said, I'm the most selfish person in the room. And someone else said, no, I am. They spent the rest of the meeting deciding who was the most selfish. And I thought, only in AA would that be a debate. They don't debate that at JC's or the, you know, the... <clears throat> only an alcoholic would find virtue in being the sickest person in the room. And when you're new, they love to reinforce that. You're the most important person in the room and you're sitting there and your life is just a mess. You've failed at everything and you go, finally, I've arrived somewhere. They've, uh, they realize my true importance. <laughs> and then they start telling you things that are really confusing because old timers know that they either need to increase your ego until it blows up or that it's already smashed and you're ready. So they'll tell you things like, oh, you get up to take a cake. Inevitably, someone in the back of the room will say, how did you do it? And by the time you're at, by the time you get from your seat to the podium, you've gone from the grace of God to a wonderful achievement. <laughs> I was told the only way to miss miracles in your life is take the credit. Turn miracles into accomplishments and you'll never have any more miracles, but you'll be a wonderful person. And you get up there and you go, how did I do it? Well, let me tell you how I did it. <laughs> Or when they ask you, are you willing to go to any length? You know what any length is for an alcoholic like me? It's not in, it's not in what I'm going to be able to do. Any length for an alcoholic like me is to say, I don't know. I don't know. That's any length. And that took a lot of years and a lot of drinking and a lot of torture to just admit, there's nothing I can do. And then they go, ah. Because, see, I think when they ask you, are you willing to go to any length, they just want to hear your list of reservations of what you think you can do to keep yourself sober. And if there's anything you can do to keep yourself sober, then you're not powerless. I'm powerless over alcohol because there's nothing I can do to keep myself sober. Our group makes fun of people in L.A. that say we just don't drink no matter what. People that have their own little list. Call somebody. What good is that going to do if an obsession hits? How about this one? Remember your last drunk. I bet there's some men and women in this room that <coughs> can't remember the last six months of their drinking. <laughs> My book says you're not going to be able to remember the, the pain and the misery of a week or a month ago, let alone 22 years ago. This isn't from experience, but there's a lot of women that, in this room that know the pain of their last childbirth wasn't a contraceptive to keep them from getting pregnant. Same thing. I can't remember with enough force. I can't remember with enough force what it was like when I got to amends the last time and why I should finish them now. Why? Because of, of a phenomena that deals with the third part of my disease. Dr. Silkworth knew about the craving. Carl Jung, the father of modern day psychology, knew about the mind. But who was it that knew about the spiritual malady? A man whose literature is no longer part of AA. A man whose literature you have to order it from other places now. And that was Dr. Bob's friend, Dr. Harry Tebow, who wrote about the dry drunk syndrome, who wrote about having had a spiritual awakening as a result of the steps, how the ego can rebuild, and why it's necessary to rework and rework and rework the first nine steps on a regular basis because of this phenomena that I don't hear old timers talking about anymore. Because a lot of them have elevated themselves, and I'm glad to be a member of a home group where they don't allow me to elevate myself to such a position that I couldn't share that kind of stuff 17 years sober, or 19 years sober, or 21 years sober. That it feels like I'm up against another wall. I can't move my life any further. I'm having trouble with personal relationships. I can't control my emotional nature. I'm experiencing misery and depression making a living isn't satisfactory to my own spirit anymore, and I can't seem to be of real help to other people. Working with others is flat, and everything that was really exciting six months ago feels like I'm just like anesthetized. <clears throat> but thank God for those that have come up against that. Thank God for those that are willing to talk about reaching a time after time after time. For me, it's about every two years I do the work. It's not the same inventory. A lot of old timers will say to me, you mean you're writing the same inventory that you did 22 years ago? No. I'm writing inventory about the stuff that I miss when I fall asleep from the last time I finished amends until now. 
because I ain't perfect at 10 and 11. And 10 and 11 for me is not just a repeat of 1 through 9. And 10 and 11 for me are not maintenance steps. Who wants to maintain a state of consciousness that's wonderful that you reach when you're done with every amends you're consciously aware of? My, the 10th and 11th step for me are about growing past that in understanding and effectiveness. <clears throat> so I left this treatment center after two days, and I spent about eight weeks up and down this street, East Colfax Avenue in Denver. And I don't know why I thought I had to move every two or three days. I guess it was alcoholic paranoia. And I would move, and I woke up August 17th in a room and there was what scared me was there was no reason I could put my finger on. Usually it's a screaming girlfriend or a hotel guy or a parole officer. This day there was no one no reason I could put my finger on and for the first time in eighteen years I couldn't drink. I never felt comfortable in, in these twenty two years of sobriety saying I quit drinking August seventeenth, nineteen eighty two. But when I read Bill's description, I was removed from alcohol for the last time. That's the way it feels to me in my heart, that I was separated from alcohol. Because I woke up in this hotel room and I couldn't drink. There was about this much left in a bottle of vodka, which was rare, and I couldn't drink. I called my mother to tell some lies to get some money, and out of my mouth came, I can't lie to you anymore. And I went back to the treatment center I had been at eight weeks earlier, and the director said they had found out about me because they were concerned when I left, and they knew how many times I'd been to treatment and they knew I was a therapist and that I had worked in treatment and that if I wanted to stay, it had to be on their terms and, 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 and their way. And I was in a state that a lot of you have been in. I was willing to do anything. And I didn't create that willingness. A magical combination of booze and God created that willingness, and it was a gift, and both of them are a gift. And I said, okay, and they said, well, these are the terms. You can't go to group because in a week you'll either run it or turn it into a game. <laughs> <laughs> you cannot talk to anybody during business hours from the time you get up until dinner except your therapist and it's Father Felix and he's a monk in a monastery at night and a therapist in the field during the day and he knows everything about God and nothing about therapy and you know everything about therapy and nothing about God and he and I were perfect. <clears throat> he told me when I got out 45 days later, I was 15 days in detox and 30 days in treatment. And he told me when I got out, he said, Joe, you can barely speak to one person. You want to go find out about how to talk to people? Go be a volunteer for the National Council and work with kids. And that's where I learned to talk with people. Because kids, a lot of you know better than I do, you can't lie. You can't. And I started going to meetings. And they said 90 meetings in 90 days. If one's good a day, I go to three. That's my philosophy. If one feels good, three is better. Right. And I got a sponsor totally different than what I wanted because I heard Don P. in my first meeting in treatment in a room like this on a Friday night in the basement of the treatment center, and it scared me. You know why it scared me? Because I heard a man who was like me. He felt like I did as a kid. What's wrong with me? He'd been to the penitentiary. He'd been on drugs. He got to AA. didn't know what he was, alcoholic, addict, both. He described how he felt. And it was me. But you know what scared me? I saw that he wasn't like me anymore. And you know what I thought? He had changed himself. And it took me six months to hit bottom with the second half of step one. You see, I thought the, blank, the dash in the first step meant fill in the blank. And this was my first step. Yes, I admit that I'm powerless over alcohol, and that's why my life is so unmanageable. So now that I'm not drinking anymore, everything should be just fine. And what I needed to see was that drunk or sober, I'm an alcoholic and I can't manage my own life. Sober. Because alcoholism is what you're left with after the body's cleaned out. This stuff that starts to come to the surface that you made a decision about never looking at again when you were young. The idea of going in, when I heard the great reality is deep down within, I knew they were talking about I was going to have to go into that place that I had decided never to go into again. But thank God when I got to that step, I didn't feel I was going into that place alone. Isn't it interesting? The last place I ever wanted to go was the only place that I was going to be able to find God. And isn't it interesting? In the middle of the garbage is the consciousness of the presence of God. So it took me six months to ask Don, 
And of course, I picked a sponsor totally, because you got to get, get a sponsor before you got out of treatment. I picked a guy totally opposite from Don. Harry was great, though. He taught me how to pick up women in treatment centers and took me to meetings and got me involved in the fellowship, dances. And we reviewed the first three steps in two hours. He said, you alcoholic? I said, yep. He said, is your life unmanageable? I said, yep. He didn't ask me why. He said, you believe in God? I said, sure. He didn't ask me what kind of God that was going to strike me down as soon as I was a bad AA member or didn't do something right that my sponsor said. He said, let's do this prayer. I said, from where? He said, this book. I didn't have a clue. We read some stupid prayer from some stupid book. And he gave me a mimeograph sheet on how to write inventory. And unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, it was a four-column inventory. You really can't do a four-column inventory without some power. You try to do four-column inventory in your head, you just end up with a big mess. I bet people in this room have had the experience where something comes off the end of your pen that didn't come from your mind. I heard a guy the other day put it more simple, because I've heard sponsors that actually say, hey, glad to meet you, glad you're new, go home, start inventory. I heard, <laughs> that's deadly. To send someone into inventory without the foundation in one, two, and three? You know, this guy the other day put it more simple than anybody I'd ever heard. He said, four comes forth. <laughs> I thought, man, that's too simple for a guy like me. You know, I would say to Don when I finally asked him at six months when I was dying inside with everything better out here, that's when you start to get ready. You got the dream out here and you're still empty in here because the unmanageability of my life ain't out here. The unmanageability of my life is being shut off from something that other people are connected to, which is the human spirit. My spirit's not sick. Our group made the mistake of interpreting spiritual malady that the human spirit was sick and an alcoholic. How could the spirit be sick? But I'll tell you, being shut off from it is a really horrible malady. Not having anywhere other to go than the three dimensions you've lived in your whole life, body, mind, and emotions. There ain't nowhere else to go. That's a horrible way to live. Shut off from power. Shut off from spirit. Shut off from the only thing that's going to be a substitute for the effects of alcohol. And even greater. So I would say to Don things like, I feel inferior and insecure. His eyes would light up the only like a sponsor's eyes can, and they always had that stupid giggle, right? Nothing more fun than when you're a sponsor, though, and you can use all that stuff that pissed you off that your sponsor did with you, right? I'd say, I'm inferior, and I feel inferior and insecure. He looked up at me and said, do you want to know why you feel inferior and insecure? I said, yeah, I've been looking for the answer to that for like, forever in therapy. He said, the reason you feel inferior and insecure is because you're inferior and insecure. <laughs> My God, that's too simple. I want it to be Freudian. I want it to be heavy. I want someone to blame. And there was nobody left to blame, and the problem wasn't out here, and I was ready for the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And that's what I'll get to talk about tomorrow. Um, since then, my life has been... I had five years in Denver. Ten amazing years in Santa Monica, living on the beach, fell in love with working with others, watched a home group grow up from 12 people who went through the work together. Then they didn't know what to do, so they started a group on 10, 11, and 12. My home group for four years, 17 years ago, you couldn't share unless you were done with the men's because it was on 10, 11, and 12, and they didn't want to hear theory. They wanted to hear experience. Nothing worse than talking about something you don't have anything but opinion with. And I don't want to hear anybody's opinion about finishing a men's who hasn't because that would all that's all it would be. I want to meet people that have done everything they can to fend every amends they're aware of. And your whole life takes off. And you enter the world of the Spirit. And after 10 years in L.A., God said, wow, you get to go to India. You get to study with the Dalai Lama and start a drug and alcohol treatment program for the Tibetan government. And I had five unbelievable years. And like rotation, as soon as the three parts of that drug and alcohol program were up and running, God said, you got to go. And I got to come back to America two years ago, just in time, because five months after I got back, my mother passed away. My oldest friend in AA died five days later. Now I'm in the middle of watching another dream come true, a dream that I, if I would have planned it myself, I would have sold myself short. I'm watching a retreat center come together up north from here that I'm going to get to be a part of, that I'm going to buy and invite friends and AA groups to come. And I'm going to get to have a non-denominational residential retreat center. It's been a dream of mine for a long time. 
It was my sponsor's dream a long time ago. He didn't get to do it. And he's, uh, might not be around a lot longer. I might not be around a lot longer. You might not be around a lot longer. But you do have a choice. Once you're in the grace of God, you do have a choice. And that is whether you want to die from alcoholism or whether you want to die with alcoholism. And I'll tell you one story and I'll shut up. My life was like this bird that lived in Michigan. And I like this story because it's about a bird. My name, my name is Hawk. And it's about this bird. It's about this bird that lives up in Michigan and one year he's not going to do what the flock does. He ain't flying to Florida. <clears throat> he's going to stay in Michigan. And he's damn near ready to freeze up. Just before he dies, he gets the slight idea it might be good to take off and head south. And he gets up in the, in the sky and, it, and it's too late. And he freezes up and he, die, he does a nose dive into a cow pasture. And he's laying there freezing to death and a cow comes by and poops all over him. <laughs> and it feels so warm and it feels so cozy. You know what's coming, don't you? It's warm and it's cozy and he yells out a song in joy because his life has been saved by the cow that pooped on him. And a fox hears the cry and comes over and pulls him out of the pile of poop and cleans him off in the snow and eats him. And you know the moral of the story? Not everybody that poops on you is your enemy. Not everybody that pulls you out of a pile of poop is your friend. And if you're sitting in a warm pile of poop and it feels really good, keep your damn mouth shut. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for letting me share. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.